In this segment, I'm going to talk about bile formation secretion and its function. To begin, let's look a little bit at the anatomy here. This is a lobule, a little schematic here. It's a hexagonal shape. This is the portal triad, which consists of the hepatic portal vein, bile duct, and arterioles. At the center of this lobule is the central vein, and this vein leads back to the heart. Moving over to here, we can see the portal vein leads into a large sinus, which empties into the central vein. And there are several of these coming in. And the last three on the bottom, I've just drawn a line to indicate where they're going. In the central vein, we'll find Kupfer cells, and the endothelial cells are discontinuous. That allows Kupfer cells, microorganisms, to pass between the cells and enter this little space here called the space of DC. And this leads to the lymphatic system where toxic substances, microorganisms can be cleared. Also located in here are hepatic stellate cells. These cells store fat and vitamin A and other fat-soluble vitamins. These cells will be converted into fibroblasts if the liver is damaged. These fibroblasts then will lay down collagen fibers, eventually leading to cirrhosis. There's an arteriole which leads into various capillaries running around, and these capillaries will eventually empty into the venous sinuses. This orange gold color here, these are hepatocytes, and we find them throughout. Right in this location, we see a bile duct, and this tube is called the canaliculus. Several of the cells surrounding this canaliculus are called cholangiocytes, and they differ from hepatocytes in their function. Well, these are hepatocytes. Over here, we see a sodium bicarbonate transporter, then there's the sodium potassium pump with a potassium channel. Organic anions can leave the cell or they can enter the canaliculus. Organic cations can also enter the canaliculus. Chloride can be exchanged for bicarbonate to create an alkaline environment. Phospholipids also moved into this canaliculus. Bile salts, BS is bile salts, and cholesterol all moved into the canaliculus. Bile salts are brought in either with a sodium co-transporter, bicarbonate exchanger, or on a facilitated transport mechanism. I've listed here some of the transporters, but I'm not going to talk about those. If you're really enthusiastic about looking these up, uh, feel free to do so. Now, if I turn this on its side, and here's the canaliculus, the bile salts, phospholipids, and organic cations and anions are moving down into the canaliculus. Cholangiocytes, then, are responsible for removing more chloride, putting more bicarbonate in there. There's chloride channels here. There's a CFTR chloride channel right here. CFTR, if you remember, stands for Cystic Fibrosis Transmembrane Regulator. And this is triggered by protein kinase A. Secretin triggers the formation of cyclic AMP, and this cascade opens up chloride channels. There are also aquaporins to allow water to enter and keep this fluid. Each of the cholangiocytes has one primary cilium. Primary cilia are located in nephrons as well, and probably many, many other places. This primary cilium is stimulated by flow. When this cilium bends, calcium channels open. Calcium inhibits adenylate cyclase. There is an adenylate cyclase associated with this as well, plus the secretin adenylate cyclase mechanism. Calcium inhibits that, which closes the CFTR channels. The function of the regulation of chloride is unknown. There are reports that show calcium triggers some chloride channels to open. So these channels may be triggered to open by calcium, whereas calcium inhibits the mechanism that opens these chloride channels. So it's really unclear as to the function of these primary cilia in cholangiocytes. In the gallbladder, we remove chloride and water Sodium chloride and water are removed. Water is then moved back out into the capillaries. In the gallbladder, we want to try to concentrate the bile. We do that by removing sodium chloride and water. Water follows osmotically. Then the water just simply leaves down through aquaporins on the other end, and on the basal side, and eventually is picked back up by capillaries. Chloride is also exchanged for bicarbonate, and chloride just simply leaks back out again. 
Once again, we see CO2 and water generating hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. The hydrogen ions are used to move sodium inward, and the bicarbonate is used to move chloride inward. Chloride then just simply moves back out its open channels. So the bile is being concentrated. Water is moving out. Some of that water can move back into the bile duct. We're looking at the liver here. We've created the bile. It moves down this direction. During fasting, the sphincter, called the sphincter of Odi, is closed. So the bile backs up into the gallbladder. And it's in the gallbladder that we begin to dehydrate this and concentrate the bile. CCK, cholecystokinin, and ACH trigger the contraction of the gallbladder. The sphincter of Odi opens and bile is released. As food enters the duodenum, the fats trigger the release of CCK, which then causes the gallbladder to contract. Contraction of the gallbladder releases bile into the duodenum. That bile continues moving through the duodenum, jejunum, and the ileum. And it's in the distal portion of the ileum that the bile salts are recovered. They then enter the hepatic portal system, return to the liver where they can be recycled. So here's a bile salt. This is glycocholic acid. And it's made up of cholesterol, and in this case, glycine is attached to it here. Also, taurine can be attached, this taurocholic acid. And you also find deoxyglycocholic acid and deoxytaurocholic acid. So these are some of the bile salts. And I've marked the hydrophilic regions with these blue stars. And if we turn it on its side, we'll see that the hydrophilic regions all face in one direction, leaving the other side to be hydrophobic. Emulsification is the process of breaking down fat droplets. So when a fat droplet enters the duodenum, bile salts and phospholipids surround it with the hydrophobic ends facing inward, the hydrophilic ends facing outward. Well, when this fat droplet is agitated by the small intestines, it breaks up. And when it breaks into smaller units, those small units are also surrounded by bile salts and phospholipids. I'm not showing the phospholipids just for simplicity. Once again, they get broken up and again surrounded. This surrounding of the fat droplet inhibits these smaller units from congealing, from coalescing, congealing, and forming a larger droplet. In the small intestines, these fat droplets get smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually forming a micelle. Segmentation is what causes the churning of the contents of the small intestine. It does so by constricting simultaneously in several places, squeezing, pushing the fluid toward the bulge in this example here. Then this region contracts, this region then bulges out, and we get this churning. Now this only happens a couple of times, and then peristalsis takes over again. This is a very slow process. Well, here we're looking at a micelle, and I'm only using phospholipids on this one because it's a lot easier to draw these. The center of this micelle is hydrophobic, and it's at this center that we can hold small molecules of fat. Water surrounds these because the hydrophilic ends are facing outward. And here we see a cutaway of a three-dimensional micelle. Now, these micelles differ from liposomes, which are bilayers. A bilayer allows an aqueous environment in the center. Intracellular vesicles are liposomes. Well, this is a micelle here. Lipase then enters the micelle, breaks up these fats into fatty acids and monoglycerides. The fatty acids and the monoglycerides enter the epithelial cells, eventually into the endoplasmic reticulum, where they're formed into triglycerides. And it's also in the endoplasmic reticulum that these triglycerides are bound to a protein. These proteins are called lipoproteins, lipid protein, and they go by the name chylomicron. They are packaged and moved to the basal membrane for exocytosis. Now, one of the problems that occurs here is that these chylomicrons are too large to enter the cardiovascular system. The capillaries of the cardiovascular system have fenestrations, but the fenestrations are too small. So these chylomicrons enter the lymphatic system. The terminal end of the lymphatic system is called a lacteal. These capillaries have mini-valves, one-way mini-valves located on them. These one-way mini-valves are very large. They can accept these large proteins. They can accept bacteria, microorganisms, even some cells. They enter the lymphatic system, and when they get to the lymph nodes, microorganisms can be destroyed 
but the chylomicrons continue moving on until they reach the cardiovascular system near the heart. Well, gallstones can occur because cholesterol is insoluble in water. If the bile becomes supersaturated with cholesterol, then the cholesterol will begin to crystallize. It will precipitate out forming crystals. Stones of calcium bilirubin may also develop, and this occurs primarily at night when ingestion is not occurring and the bile salts are now being desiccated. We're losing a lot of water. We're concentrating the bile and the cholesterol is becoming concentrated. And this is the period in which people who are prone to gallstones will begin to see development of these stones. These stones can obstruct the bile duct. They can lead to fatty stools, which is steatorrhea. Less free fatty acids in the intestines also reduce the absorption of fat and fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A, D, E, and vitamin K. What we do is take out the gallbladder. When we remove the gallbladder, we will not see a large bolus of bile being released during a meal. Rather, it's a continuous leakage of bile coming from the liver and entering through the sphincter vodi into the duodenum. Small amounts of fat could easily be digested. However, if you have a large bolus of fat, such as in a pizza or a big bowl of ice cream, you may find steatorrhea occurring. Another pathology involving bile is called cholestasis. Cholestasis is the absence of bile flow. There are two main causes for cholestasis. One is the failure to secrete bile acids and salts. This could be genetic, produced by certain drugs. Cholangitis, a tumor, stenosis, other forms can occur which will block the bile duct. Well, that ends this talk on formation, secretion, and function.